But let me show you some headlines that came out in the last few days about uh, good old Millet. Okay, here it is. Why Argentina's shock measures may be the best hope for its ailing economy. Analysis of Millet's mission improbable for Argentina has investors daring to dream. Yeah, a lot of people are dreaming. And they think that maybe uh, something's going to change over there. Okay. Anxiety and resignation in Argentina after Millet's economic shock measures. Immediately, Millet uh, put uh, all these shock measures in place, specifically the dollar. He devalued um, uh, the, um, the, the peso, you know, uh, by raising it uh, compared to the dollar. It was uh, less than 400, was about 350, 360, and now uh, per dollar, and now it's 800 pesos per dollar. Okay, so he raised, and that caused a big shock because suddenly all the prices in Argentina uh, doubled. And I got an example there for you in a minute. Millet uh, moves to limit anti-austerity protests in Argentina. So they're going to use some heavy handedness there to uh, uh, quell any riots or any, any uh, uh, you know, protests. And Argentina's new president's alarmed LGBTQ activists with closure of diversity ministry. He's even done that. And uh, the previous government had a different take on that. And here, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And here you'll see why, okay? Uh, that's Fernandez's son, not daughter, but son there on the left. His name is Estanislao Fernandez. And he likes to dress up as a woman. And then on the right-hand side, you see Bolsonaro, who was the president of Brazil at the time, uh, son. And uh, when you compare them, well, you can see why many Argentines were not very happy with that comparison, <laughs> okay? And so, and so, um, you know, what, what happened in the end was that, you know, uh, uh, Fernandez was overthrown, essentially. You know, he was voted out of power, and we have this guy, Millet. And, yeah, he's going to go against uh, all this stuff um, that he thinks it's uh, not worth spending a penny on, okay? So... Uh, just new things that are going on and uh, obviously a big change in policy not only that uh, Millet um, aligned himself with the United States and with the Western world which is a total change from uh, the Fernandez regime the two Fernandez regimes even um, even the, the woman you know Christina and they're not related the two Fernandez by the way they have the same last name but it's a very common name down there and so, yeah, you have, uh, for almost 20 years, you've had the Fernandez in one way or another, the Peronists in po uh, power, and that's now radically changed in the other direction. Now it's conservative, right? You could say conservative, from liberal to conservative. And uh, another important detail that's uh, important to you know, keep in mind is that Millet wants to be a Jew. He wants to be a, uh, he wants to convert. And uh, that's somewhat of a problem in Argentina because there are secret groups, you know, um, that are against Jews over there. And, uh, you know, he's going to have to deal with that. And a lot of military are involved in that as well. Very nationalistic, very uh, ultra nationalistic, very anti Jewish. And, uh, you know, you have all kinds of groups there. And so, you know, uh, the question is whether he can continue with this government, uh, especially with the drastic measures he's taking. And everybody, I think, agrees that in the short run, things are going to be very tough for the Argentines, right? And I can just give you an example that happened to me. I was there uh, about a month ago, and uh, the, the trip from the airport to the city, to the center of the city, by bus, the Tienda Leon, which is the famous... Uh, bus uh, route that carries people to the center of the city uh, cost four dollars and it's like a 45 minute ride so it's quite cheap now it's eight dollars today okay, at the exchange rate and um, and then uh, there was a uh, we made a trip from Buenos Aires to St. Louis St. Louis uh, out there in the west it's an 11 hour ride on the bus and that cost us $25, and now it costs over 50 
So you can see how that's going to impact a lot of people there. And, uh, you know, all the prices rising and so on. So I don't know what's going to happen. In the short run, there's going to be a lot of pain. And uh, if he can withstand that, you know, maybe through measures, uh, military measures, you know, police. <laughs> how do you contain the riots, right? Um, well, maybe something happens where the country rises back up again. Uh, that's for us to see. You know, it's like they say in the long run. But like someone, the economist once said, in the long run, we're all dead. <laughs> so we don't know about the long run. But the short run, uh, there's going to be a lot of pain. And probably there's going to be a lot of burning of tires and breaking of windows, you know, riots. Okay, so here's uh, one, uh, one of the problems that uh, Millet has. And that's got, he's got a 400 billion debt bomb. Okay, he's got to, <laughs> you got to deactivate that bomb. And I don't know if he'll be able to. Um, they owe like 50 billion to uh, the monetary fund, the International Monetary Fund. And in fact, today, uh, or yesterday, I think he got a, uh, a loan from a uh, South American conglomerate there uh, for 1 billion. And so he says, hey, that's, I'm already on top. I've already achieved something. And maybe he does. I don't know. Uh, it wasn't good for me because when I was there a month ago, I paid everything very, very cheaply. And now if I go there, <laughs> it's going to be a lot more expensive. So for me, it wasn't good. I mean, damn the country. The country is, uh, you know, a problem for the people in Argentina. You know, no doubt about it. They're going to suffer. And they were suffering. Here comes this fellow and he just changes it. He just drops a bomb on everybody, you know. So it's going to be tough. And I don't know if they can recover from that, but we'll find out, right? The point here is that for me, it's not good simply because, you know, when you go there with dollars or euros, you know, you can stretch them quite, you know, everything's very cheap. And now it's less cheap, you know. So for me, it wasn't good, but, you know, that's that's the breaks. Okay, and uh, here's another uh, headline there. It says, he says, there's no alternative to shock treatment. He says, there's no money. <laughs> Essentially, that's what he told the public. Inflation's at 142%, 43 billion in debt. Um, and it says uh, he's an anarcho-capitalist, uh, which I call narco-caps, right? And it says uh, currently one dollar's worth uh, 385. That's what it was worth until he came, and now uh, uh, he changed that to 800. So now a uh, dollar in the official market is 800 dollars, 800 pesos. And so he doubled it. <laughs> and that's what caused, caused all the prices to skyrocket. And yeah, uh, if you go to Argentina, uh, mark my words, I haven't done it I've, you know, for the last 40, 50 years. I've never exchanged at the uh, official rate. Never, never used credit cards. Not in Argentina. You'd be very stupid to do so. Why? Because always the black market gives you more than what the government gives you. And there's a thriving black market that's so been there for a long time. And they never give you fake bills. They, they try to scare you, say, hey, you might get a fake bill. No, you never get a fake bill because they make enough money as it is. They don't need to put fake bills into circulation. If anyone, it's the government who puts fake bills into circulation. Anyways, uh, so what is a narco cap, a narco capitalist, which is what this Millet fellow says he is, okay? And here it is. This comes from the Wikipedia. Narco-capitalism, or they say ANCAP, but I prefer narco, right, is an anti-statist libertarian political philosophy and economic theory that seeks to abolish what? Centralized states in favor of stateless societies with systems of private property enforced by private agencies, the non-aggression principle, free markets, and self-ownership which extends the concept to include control of private property as part of the self. Uh -huh. But here comes uh, the nice part. It says, in the absence of statute, anarcho-capitalists hold that society tends to contractually self-regulate and civilize through participation in the free market, which they describe as voluntary society involving the what? Voluntary exchange of goods and services in a theoretical anarcho-capital society, the system of private property would still exist and be enforced by what? Private defense agencies, private defense agencies, and or 
in uh, insurance companies selected by customers, which would operate competitively in a market and fulfill the roles of courts and the justice. So the question is, you know, who are they going to hire? I mean, Ivan the Terrible uh, or what? Attila the Hun, Genghis Khan. Uh, who, who are these uh, private companies that they're going to, you know, hire to protect you? Uh, I can only be very, very extremely skeptical of narco caps. Uh, it's a lot of the people who, especially the young youth, the young generation, who are so fed up with government intervening in their lives and telling them you got to get a vaccine and, you know, all this kind of stuff, that what, what has happened, they've gone the other way and they say, we don't want any more government. We're sick of government. And they're all politicians. They're all crooks, you know. And so people have lost confidence in the politicians and they don't want them anymore. And they say, look, I hate for government to come in here and tax me when I can just reach a deal with my neighbor and, ex and exchange something with them. You know, he, he wants my table and I want his TV. So we trade. It's a voluntary exchange. That's the way they want it, you know. And the problem I see at least the overall problem is that first, this is microeconomics. And what this guy Millet is doing is he's doing macroeconomics. He's going to be applying this to the whole country. That's one issue. And they're not the same thing. You know, one thing is to trade with your neighbor without government intervention. In fact, that's what happens with the peso versus the dollar. You know, you go out in the street, you exchange with someone, and he gives you peso, and you give him a dollar, and he gives you more pesos than the government. Very simple. It's uh, narco cap at its best. You know, but uh, the question is, you know, these people live under the umbrella of government and it's easy to trade and do all that stuff when you have a government, when you have already a society running. And these people say we're going to get rid of government, you know, and do it on our own. We, we want freedom from government. And, you know, they haven't invented anything, uh, partly because, you know, that's why they use that name anarcho, because they are anarchists. And they haven't invented anarchism, for sure. You know, anarchists uh, came to being in the 19th century and uh, early 20th century, especially, you know. And they, they were these guys who threw uh, Molotov cocktails. <laughs> so uh, everybody looks at a, uh, an anarchist as a uh, violent person in general. But these guys say, no, no, we're going to do it the civilized way. We're going to do anarcho-capitalism, you know, and so we're going to do it, you know, by just ignoring the government, trying to get away from them and finding ways of skirting taxes and all that, all of these things that they impose on us. And we're going to try to do our own thing on the side. Yeah, you can do that. You can do it on your own. But the question is, uh, you know, you're, you've got still the government there. How do you get rid of government is the question. And, uh, you know, one of the guys who tackled that was Marx himself, Karl Marx said, hey, you know, communism, this is the way he envisioned it, will evolve to a point where at some point, you know, uh, people are going to decide that they don't need government anymore and government itself will cease to exist. He saw the same thing. He was uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, deep in his heart, he was an anarchist. You know, in other words, he said, let's do communism first and we'll work our way, you know, through the dictatorship of the proletariat. We're going to work our way to no government, to anarchism. What he objected to is imposing anarchism, you know, anarchy that same in his days. He said it's too early. That's more or less the way he looked at it. And so there were differences between the anarchists and the communists there in, the, in, those, in that sense. But these people haven't uh, really, um, you know, invented anything. Uh, they, they want to get, free themselves from government. And I wish them good luck. <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to happen, especially when we're running out of time. What do we say here in this channel? We're the last generation of humans on Earth. And so I don't think there's enough time for them to impose this ideal society where there is no government. You know, I used to think in those terms myself once, you know, uh, saying someday or it'd be nice if there was a world government and then world government itself ceases to exist. Yeah, great as a dream. <laughs> uh, another thing is reality and achieving it. Okay. Anyways, uh, you know, uh, uh, primarily I want to say that in this channel, uh, the best answer for this fellow is that we don't we don't really do politics. OK, I don't like to do politics and I stopped doing politics a long, long time ago. I'd say at least 30 years. OK, 
uh, I don't do politics, meaning what is politics? Politics is opinion, and opinion is religion. Politics is simply one kind of religion. That's all it is. And uh, because what is it? It's opinion. Some people like, you know, candidate A, the other guy likes candidate B. Some people like Ukraine, other people like Russia, some people like uh, Israel, some people like the Hamas or suffer for them. Some people like the Azerbaijanis, others like the, you know, Armenians and China and Taiwan and uh, India and Pakistan. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. Uh, should you take sides? You know, uh, people suffer and they get all nervous, they read the news and they say, look what's happening over there, look what's happening over there, and they're killing people here and they're killing people there. And they begin to take sides. And it turns out, you know, uh, if, you know, the solution is very simple, <laughs> simple, just turn your TV off, you know, and forget it. If it gets you nervous, it gets you excited, hey, turn your TV off. That's the solution to all your problems. You solve all the world problems with that. And you have to remember also that the politicians, they don't care. <laughs> they do whatever they have to and they do whatever they want. They do whatever is in their best interest. And I'll give you an example. You know, on the one hand, you have Netanyahu in Israel. And he says, oh, we're going to free the hostages. And he sends an army to, <laughs> to beat up the people in Hamas and try to recover, uh, you know, uh, rescue uh, the hostages. And that's more or less like, you know, someone is held hostage in a house, right? And there's a gunman with, with a gun to the, to the hostage's head. And you have all the police all around there. How do you think you're going to free the guy? You think you're going to free the guy by, you know, storming the house? Well, I doubt it because as soon as someone gets into the first bullet goes to that head. And so, you know, it's not the way you want to free people, you know. So what they're doing now is just... A lot of lip service are saying, look, we're going to free the hostages and they're doing it with the army. Uh, for sure, they're not going to free a single one if they do it that way. The only way to do that is to negotiate, right? If you want to really free the hostages. So on the one hand, they say, we want to free the hostages. And on the one hand, they send the army. That's on one side. How about the other side? How about the Arab side? And this shows you why you should choose sides. The Arab side, you have Iran and Iran is telling all the Arab countries there and saying, look, you guys want to be real? You want to help Hamas? You, you really root for the Arab world? Very simple. Stop all commerce with Israel. You know, boycott Israel. I mean, just like Europe and, Ru and the United States did with Russia, right? Do the same thing to Israel. And what do the uh, Arab countries do? And I'm talking about several of them. Well, they said, uh, we're going to pull our ambassadors. We're going to withdraw our ambassadors in protest. Well, that's very cosmetic of you, you know. Why don't you do what Iran says, you know, and says, uh, go in there and boycott the economy. Then it's going to hurt them. But as long as you keep the economy rolling, you're just giving lip service to saying that you are in favor of the Hamas group and that you, want to, you, know, you really suffer for all those people. So the politicians on both sides, they just play games. And all I can say is you're a fool if you root for any of them. The best thing, don't root for any of them. The politicians will do what they have to do anyways, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so that's the way I see that. So yeah, stay away from opinion. Here, here's a, a comparison. Who do you think is best? Uh, Bugs Moran, north side of Chicago, 1930s there, 1920s, late 1920s really. Uh, or the south side, Al Capone. I mean, who do you think uh, sh you should root for? Okay. Should you go with the North or with the South? <laughs> well, my suggestion is, um, you know, don't go with any of them. You know, they're all mafias. And uh, same with all these politicians. They'll do whatever they have to do anyway. So it doesn't uh, help you to lose a single drop of feeling for any of that. And again, if you do, uh, just turn your TV off. You'll have salt. Okay, so is Argentina the only place in the world that's got problems? Well, here, uh, let me show you something. This is Iraq, okay? And it says, Iraq scrambles to contain fighting between U.S. troops and Iran-backed groups, fearing Gaza spillover, okay? And it says there, uh, listen to this, it says, Baghdad uh, relies heavily on Washington's sanction waivers to buy electricity from Iran. And since the, the 2003 U.S., invasion, Iraq's foreign currency reserves have been housed at the U.S. Federal Reserve. 
Iraq's money is in New York, <laughs> giving the Americans significant control over Iraq's supply of dollars. The United States extended Iraq's sanctions waiver by four months to purchase Iranian electricity. Washington has used the sanctions waiver as one of its cards, you know, pressure points, in an economy-centered efforts to pressure Iran and Iraq. Okay, and here you see uh, what kind of effect that has. Uh, people go out into the streets because they're having uh, economic problems, okay? And again, it says, uh, for months, the United States has restricted Iraq's access to its own dollar, <laughs> trying to stamp out what Iraqi officials describe as rampant money laundering that benefits Iran and Syria. Okay, and so it goes on and on. The point here is that, you know, um, all these countries depend on the United States. So you wonder how come the United States has so much power uh, in negotiating power of politics and so on, because it controls a lot of the money that these people need. And the governments maybe have idealistic people in their, in their country, you know, nationalistic and so on, and religious fanatics and so on. And they have to cater to them if they want to stay in power, but at the same time they have to be, you know, they have to shake hands with both the devil and God. You know, and so they have to cater also to the United States and say, look, we're doing our best here to keep the crowds down and so on. So, you know, they have all these uh, pressures from above and below, and they try to, you know, walk a middle line, uh, partly for their own personal interests, right? Uh, that's the way politics works. So, again, you should not put any heart, any feeling behind any of this stuff. And Iraq's the only one, Argentina are the only ones. Well, take a look here. It says India, Brazil, and Mexico, uh, India, Brazil, Mexico, and Indonesia could emerge as engines of global growth. One, one liner that I found around there, right? And so you look at these and say, okay, let's see how well these people are doing. And the reason they mentioned those four countries is they're highly populated. There's a lot of population there. Uh, says here, uh, India, uh, for example, Brazil, economic growth will be just 2.8 in 2022 and 1.2 in 2023. The current economic crisis, right, there's a crisis there, has had a severe effect on the Brazilian labor market. In 2021, the World uh, Bank calculated 14.4% of working age Brazilians were unemployed. And I would say it's higher because all those people who work in services are also unemployed. Okay, is Indonesia doing any better? Okay, another very populous country, uh, I think third or fourth in the world. The three key economic challenges for the Indonesian government are controlling inflation, providing job opportunities through investments, and maintaining growth. How about Pakistan, another populous country, is faced with a number of economic challenges with, which include a balance of payment crisis, Soaring inflation, mounting debt obligations, and persistent budget deficit. And then we look at Nigeria, the biggest uh, economy in Africa, in the continent of Africa, followed by Egypt and uh, South Africa. And it says uh, persistent inflation to reach a 17-year high of 25.8% in August 2023, which, in combination with sluggish growth, is leaving millions of Nigerians in poverty. Okay. Uh, so how are all these countries doing? Well, I think they're all doing terrible. There's not a single country on the planet that's doing good. And you might say, well, that's always been like that through history. Uh, this is new. What we have today is new. And uh, I keep saying, you know, the reason it's new is that we're in a different type of eco uh, economic, mode, economic mode. We're in a service economy. Before we were in, you know, manufacturing, and before that we were in agriculture. Service economy, totally different ballgame, okay? Uh, the most advanced nations on the planet have 80, 85 percent of their economy is services. What is services? Services is another word for unemployment. You don't do anything. You're not producing anything. You know, you look from the sky, you look down on the earth, you see what's constructed. You see the material things that have been constructed and, and made. You don't see the promises. You don't see the bank accounts. You don't see insurance, you know, all those and any other service that you can think of. You know, those are not there. Service is unemployment. There's nothing being produced. And you judge a country's expansion by, you know, how much 
progress you see in the material things, okay? And so uh, all I can tell you is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of unemployment and we're creating more services and less manufacturing, which is be a lot of it being replaced by robots, by the way, and more efficiency. And um, agriculture in the, the most advanced nations is like 1% of their GDP. So uh, just keep all that in mind. Uh, the global economy is not doing well at all. And what, is the, what do we say here? We're going to say that the global economy is at some point going to collapse. We cannot grow forever. Partly we cannot grow forever because population doesn't grow forever. In fact, population has been, it's not declining. It's still growing, but it's growing at an ever slower rate. And we will reach zero population growth on the planet as a whole, uh, probably by mid-century if things continue as they are now. That means that companies that expect more demand tomorrow, more customers, well, they're going to be out of luck because there's going to be fewer and fewer marginal, you know, uh, increases in in, um, in population. That means you're going to have less and less demand over time. At some point, there's going to be a crisis that cannot be solved just by creating money or just modifying the money supply or anything like that. Any fiscal or uh, monetary policy will fail. You just can't put people to work uh, in un unnecessary jobs. And we're going to reach that stage. I think th and at that point, uh, at some point, money will be no more. In fact, we're having a very interesting situation in Argentina <laughs> where people can barely make it to the end of the month. And uh, the government is now giving a bonus between 50,000 and 80,000 pesos, which is about 50 to 80 dollars to keep them running till the end of the month. That's how bad things are over there. And you say, well, that's just Argentina. But that's going to come to a lot of countries when uh, they reach a certain level where they can't grow anymore because, you know, you can't have just external investments because a lot of that also takes money out of the country, right? And so on, there's, there's this play. But just to make a long story short, I'm just saying you cannot keep growing forever economically. Okay? And at that point, at some point right there, no matter how much money they give, you will not be able to make it till the end of the month. And even the workers, you know, they, they receive money and they barely make it to the end of the month. Ba they can barely pay rent and also food. And at some point, there, there's going to be such a crisis that people will say, hey, money is worthless. I don't want that money anymore. I, I want something real, <laughs> like food, you know. And it will be the fight between the haves and have-nots. The haves will be those who have food and the have-nots will be those that don't. <laughs> Okay, that's uh, in a nutshell what I have to say about that. But again, we don't do politics here. I'm not interested in politics. The only reason I mentioned politics is in relation to extinction. That's the only time I put economics and politics into, uh, into the conversation. Other, other than that, I'm not interested in either subject in, uh, in any specific way, you know. Okay, uh, another subject that came up, and that's I'm going to close with this, and here it is, this uh, panspermia stuff. It says, scientists surprised by samples recovered from ancient asteroid. Asteroid name is Bennu, or Bennu. Among the findings from the early Bennu analysis are what could be the building blocks of life, organic compounds containing carbon-carbon or carbon-hydrogen bonds. Meteorites found on Earth have had similar compounds, and as nature explains, those carbon-rich minerals may have contributed to life on our planet. Okay. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, little bugs crawling on, a, um, on an asteroid and having a free trip down here to uh, Earth, right? And so what is this panspermia? Well, here it is. Here's the definition from the Wikipedia. It says the hypothesis that life exists throughout the universe, distrib distributed by space dust, meteoroids, uh, asteroids, comets, planetoids, as well as by spacecraft carrying unintended contamination by microorganisms, uh, known as directed panspermia. Okay, the theory argues that life did not originate on Earth, but instead evolved somewhere else and seeded life as we know it. And this is what panspermia requires: says uh, that life has always existed in the universe somewhere, and we have no problem with that one because we're saying the universe was eternal. There was no never a first living entity in the universe. So we agree with this. 
uh, except we have a different context for it, okay? Organic molecules originated in space, perhaps to be distributed to Earth. Absolutely not. Life originated from these molecules extraterrestrially. Well, there is extraterrestrial life out there. I'm convinced of that, but uh, that doesn't mean that number four is correct, which is this extraterrestrial life was transported to Earth. Okay, here we maintain that... Um, um, you know, uh, life cannot, no living entity can travel interstellarly, let alone intergalactically, okay? It's impossible. It's just beyond, uh, Mother Nature never intended for that to happen, neither did Father Universe. So here we have uh, what these people say, that let me illustrate this, here it goes. You see the little bug on an asteroid, okay? Some kind of bug, some kind of living entity, it doesn't matter, and the asteroid comes to Earth, right? And somehow, you know, lands, you could say collides, we can say it has a soft landing, no problem. And the bug now, you know, uh, travels within the earth, maybe on a branch of a tree, you know, and he gave life to all of us eventually, right? Okay, and it's not that kind of a bug that we're talking about. Obviously, uh, I'm just showing that there's a living entity traveling on, on a rock, right? And no, it's impossible. It's impossible first because the rope uh, does not allow, okay, for any uh, rope model of light does not allow for any living entity to travel to the nearest star. Okay, uh, you can send robots. Yeah, that could happen, but not living entities. Okay, and living uh, is that which moves by itself without the, you know, artificial, not, not artificial, I mean, uh, natural, uh, that uh, moves against gravity, moves against the uh, path of least resistance, okay? Anyways, the point here is that I think uh, the world is about to collapse very soon, the global economy. When, not if, but when that happens, well, we're all um, screwed. <laughs> uh, it's the end of man. It's the end of our species. And someday, I think, we have to end. Why not sooner than later? I mean, do we get to choose... Uh, or does Mother Nature get to choose when humans disappear from the face of the earth? And with humans, the whole mammal uh, order uh, disappears as well. And uh, that's what happened to the dinosaurs, you know. And part of the reason for that is that we're going to liquidate any living entity before we go. <laughs> we're going to eat it. Okay? So get ready for the next few years, something might happen. And I think it's uh, going to be sooner than, rather than later. That's my five cents worth on that.